The Denver Federal Center lies midway between Denver and Golden in Colorado. This one by one mile site, shown by the red boundary, includes large offices for the BLM, USGS, IRS, EPA, GSA, and other federal agencies. The actual study area, shown by the yellow rectangle, includes a portion of the northeastern corner of the Federal Center in an off-site region to the northeast. Here's an enlargement of the study area, showing the Federal Center to the southwest, Kipling, a major north-south thoroughfare, and 6th Avenue, a divided four-lane highway. The area to the east is made up of residential neighborhoods. In order to constrain the subsequent geochemical modeling, it was necessary to first create a hydrostratigraphic model for the site. The geology is fairly simple, with a layer of alluvium lying on top of weathered Denver formation paleosol. The Denver is a Cretaceous volcaniclastic that features Tyrannosaurus and Stegosaurus fossils. The unweathered Denver is relatively impermeable, while the weathered portions of the Denver and the overlying quaternary alluvium are quite permeable. The hydrological gradient is to the northeast. The original data set includes over 40 elements and compounds sampled at least twice a year over a 20 plus year period, translating to 1,600 possible models. We limited our study to a single contaminant, trichloroethylene or TCE, sampled from 2005 to 2008. This proved to be a poor choice because the plume didn't do much during that period, as shown by the models on this slide. Two-dimensional contoured maps representing the highest values for the plume at any given vertical point are shown within this slide. There does seem to be a bit of narrowing and breakup towards the end of 2008 that isn't immediately apparent within the 3D diagrams. A much more interesting and useful way of presenting the two-dimensional maps is to create a dynamic movie showing the contours changing over time. Note the date at the top of the map. We do see some evidence in early 2009 that the faucet or source seems to have been turned off or at least cut back. Displaying the same data in 3D may look more interesting than the 2D movie, but in this case, I found the 2D to be more useful from the standpoint of really seeing where things are changing. Sometimes, 3D is too much. The workflow that was involved with this project looks something like this. The initial data set from the General Services Administration consisted of an MDB database. As is often the case, the organization of this database was different than the RockWorks database. As a consequence, we were forced to create a data mapping template within Microsoft Access for moving the GSA data into the differently named RockWorks fields. If you find yourself doing something similar, be sure to save these templates so that you don't have to relive the hassle in the event that more data becomes available midway through your analysis. Now once the data was loaded in the RockWorks compatible MDB format, it was time to verify the data by correcting for duplicate points, transposed numbers, inconsistent units, and so on. Finally, we were able to start the fun part. Once we started creating numerical models, we were able to slice through the models to create 2D cross-sections as well as fence and isosurface 3D diagrams, animations, and figures for the final report. Now all of these operations enclosed within this green region can be automated, and here's how it works. Although RockWorks is 100% menu-driven, it is possible to create scripts that bypass the menus and do things with RockWorks. Here's one such example of a script segment. This is the RockWorks command language, or RCL for short. RCL scripts consist of these defined commands that essentially override the last used menu settings. Each block of menu configuration settings is followed by an execute command that performs the menu operation using the aforementioned menu settings. It's fairly low tech. It's also indispensable when performing repetitious tasks. As I mentioned before, this site has the potential for generating over 1,600 models. Now, let's say that the client requested cross-sections every 50 feet perpendicular to the plume axis. That translates to 144,000 possible diagrams. Now, let's say that upon completion, we find out that 10 wells were inadvertently omitted from the original database. With RCL, it's not a problem. Just re-import the data and launch the script. Without RCL, it's the kind of problem that will define your career. 
Okay, that's it for the Part 2 case study. Please select the Part 3 option from the previous menu to see a demonstration of the actual program in regards to modeling contaminant plumes.